Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, you're honorable and holy and just, and your law is very sacred, and we're trying our best to be um, commandment keepers, and uh, whenever we slip or fall, we realize that it's in that moment we were in a state of unbelief, or our faith was lacking. Um, your word is spirit, and there's power in the word, and we can uh, believe and trust in your word that it'll do a work in us. Um, and so we just ask that uh, we would uh, cooperate with you, and on this Sabbath day that we'd be uh, more interested in uh, spiritual things, and um, that we'd study hard and tax our minds. Um, we're supposed to love you with all our um, hearts and minds and soul, and in order to love you with all of our mind, we need to, um, like Sister White says, we need to tax our minds. And so we're trying to learn as much as we can in as little time as that we have so that we can um, give all of this knowledge to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's actually a picture of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls there. And um, the, the title of this little presentation is Betrayal of Sacred Trust. And it'll become pretty obvious why as we start to um, look at some of the other pictures. And the first two uh, slides... Um, after this one will just be some uh, quick quotes, and then um, after that will mostly be pictures, and I'll uh, add a little bit of commentary. And I think this should be a pretty enjoyable presentation. Okay, and just so it, you can uh, proof text this out in your own time, but the synagogue of Satan is, um, it is uh, a large confederacy. It is, uh, it is a... Uh, Satan does have a church. He pretends to be pious. And uh, one of the um, marked characters is that there's a, an accusatory misrepresenting spirit. I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek looking out from the side glass at the door and saw a company marching up to the house. Two and two. They looked stern and determined. I knew them well and turned to open the parlor door to receive them. But I thought I'd look again. The scene was changed. The company now presented the appearance of a Catholic procession. One bore in his hand a cross, another a reed. And as they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house saying three times, this house is prescribed, this house is prescribed, this house is prescribed. The goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. Terror seized me, and I ran through the house, out of the north door, and found myself in the midst of a company, some of whom I knew, but I dare not speak a word to them for fear of being betrayed. I tried to seek a retired spot where I might weep and pray without meeting uh, eager, inquisitive eyes wherever I turned. I repeated frequently, if I could only understand this, if I could only understand this, if they will tell me what I've said or what I've done. A very interesting um, dream that she had. Here's a manuscript that we're probably familiar with. I saw that the nominal churches and nominal Adventists, like Judas, would betray us to the Catholics to obtain their influence to come against the saints. The saints will be an obscure people, but little known to the Catholics. But the church and nominal Adventists will know of our faith and customs and will betray the saints and report them to the Catholics as those who disregard the institution of the Pope. That is, they, that is, they keep the Sabbath and disregard Sunday. I think it's interesting, too, that Christ said uh, he, he, went in, he went into the Sabbath, he went um, to the synagogue every Sabbath as it was his custom. And here, um, the nominal Adventists will know of our faith and customs and will betray um, us the saints. So there's the faith and then there's, there's the customs as well. 
Does everybody know who this man is that's shaking the Pope's uh, hand right here? This is his, that's his last name is uh, Diop. And he's in charge of public affairs and religious liberty. He's the re religious liberty director for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so he's a very powerful man in the church. Uh, he's right up there at the top. And he's in the Vatican. That's in the Vatican, it looks like. And Is that the one who keeps religious freedom for people who are getting sued, whatever? Generally, like a, if it was like a Protestant a couple hundred years ago, when they were going to the Vatican, it was because they were being, um, you know, they, they were experiencing an Inquisition. They were being pulled before the court of the Vatican and and asking to give a reason for their faith and things like this. But this. This is this is ecumenical in its nature. It's not. Um, he's not witnessing to the Pope. He's or anything like that. This is this is um, this is like policy right here. Are you saying that, that that man is in the White House representing the Seventh Day Adventist Church? Yes, he's representing the he's representing the church. And this is from 2015. The articles are you could very easily just. Google his name and say Vatican or some sort of generic thing, and you can sort of read um, what his. Because he, I mean, um, there's there was a lot of uproar about this, and people are like, "What well, what are you doing?" Or and some people were just curious, like, "What this doesn't seem right." And he gives he gives public statements, and I actually have a little some of them in my presentation. What's amazing to me is that the church has been doing things like this every once in a while, over and over and over again. Not like they just don't seem to get enough of their contact with the papers. Yeah. So here he, so that's Ted Wilson, okay, and there, there's there's Diop again, and um, that's a uh, that's a UN uh, director, and um, I should have I should have written down his name for the presentation, but why don't, we can look we can look it up after if there's if someone would like to know. Uh, the UN, um, they're very globalistic. Uh, we know in prophecy that there won't be a one world government because the nations won't be able to cleave to each other, but they're still trying to pursue that. And so, um, and the nations are angry because they're drunken from the wrath of, um, uh, how, how does it go? The wrath of the, the cup of Babylon. Uh, need to get my verbiage correct, but, um, and those are, those are the false heresies. So, um, so you do see this. Here is um, why. So there is there is public concern, and people are asking, well, um, why are Adventists uh, why do why Adventists participate in UN and ecumenical meetings, as we just saw in the two pictures above. And this is dated 2015, and this is this is a public response here. Um, and this is Diop's response. And this is just the first paragraph. Seventh-day Adventist believers um, shower me with questions when they learn that I have represented the Adventist Church in the United Na uh, Nations and at meetings of Christian ecumenical organizations. Um, here's a part that I blew up. Um, in principle, Adventists choose not to be involved in doctrinal alliances with other churches, keep that in mind, because of the Adventist adherence to a holistic and integrated approach to biblical doctrines and because of upholding of the upholding of doctrines that Adventists consider have been sidelined, changed, or forgotten in the course of history. That said, unity is not a bad word. Adventists value unity just as God does. Unity is grounded, so this is the foundation, in the existence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So this is, this is double speak because at the top he's saying Adventists choose not to be involved in doctrinal alliances, and then he's like, but unity is grounded in the doctrine of the existence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and we know 
that he's speaking about the Trinity, because um, that's, that's like the apostolic, um, that verbiage is very much, can be found in, you know, Roman Catholic creeds, like, um, it's, it's sort of, it sort of originates, you won't find it uh, verbatim in the Nicene Creed, but that's, that understanding comes from um, the, Nice, the Nicene Creed and the theology around that era. And uh, so he's saying that we're uniting on this point and pretty much this point alone because we don't agree on these other points. And what's also interesting is he says we're not going to align with them doctrinally because of the Adventists here to a holistic and integrated approach to biblical doctrines, but very much like uh, Sunday keeping, where the Roman Catholic has statements where they say, um, Sunday is not found in the Bible. It's solely through the church authority alone, and it's the mark of the church's authority that we move the solemnity from the Sabbath to Sunday. And this, and this is why you. Sh- this is why you should um, to bow to our authority, because uh, we have the power to do this. Well, likewise, if you if you look at um, um, sort of ecumenical statements and. Um, and uh, ecclesiastical type statements. Uh, what's the word that I'm um, looking for? Um, I can't think of it right now, but it'll come back to me. You, they have the same exact statements about the Trinity. The Trinity is not, a, is not something that can be found um, um, in the Bible, um, but we, we deduce it from the Bible, or they say kind of strange things like that. But they, from their own, from their own mouth, they don't believe that the Trinity is in the Bible, and neither do they believe that Sunday is in the Bible. They believe that that's solely originates from church, the church and church tradition, and they are able to do that because the Pope is um, the incarnation of Christ Himself. So he has he's God on earth, and so that's very interesting. That he's like we're not gonna we have we have different biblical beliefs, but we we are gonna unite on the on the Trinity. Yeah, it'd be good if we started docu- cataloging these statements, so it's just not, um, so we can just show, we can open up, show people. So just before before I change slides again, the main point that I I just want to address is that the the sole theological reason given in in this response for why they are uniting is th- uh, the idea or belief in the Trinity. And um, so that is what is binding us um, to these, um, to the Protestant, fallen Protestant churches and the Catholic churches. It's why the SDA church is going and meeting with the Pope, meeting with these high UN delegates and things like that. And they're not, they're, they're not bashful about it. Um, who, who else says, so, okay, let's, remember he says, the unity is grounded, so it's the foundation of unity and brotherhood, um, brotherly love, is in the existence of this idea. And uh, the Pope says this too, right? He says ecumenicism, this is Catholic News Agency, ecumenicism, a spiritual process rooted in the Trinity. He, I mean, this is, this is uh, if, if, you've seen, if you've seen Diop, you've seen the Pope. They're of the same mind, grounded in the idea of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So they're saying that they're speaking the same language, and this is about unity. This is this is ecumenicism. That's why he said that. Kellogg um, also said something similar. Um, remember that he was trying to make the SDA Church a non-denominational church, and so here's just a picture of him when he's a younger man. But in a letter for, uh, from Daniels, I want to say to Butler. <laughs> Um, he quotes Kellogg as saying he told him that he now believes in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The exact same lingo or phraseology as what Diop was using. And there's going to be an alpha and an omega. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
yes, EQ, um, this is my definition, and then at the end we'll, we'll get an official definition. Um, the ecumenical uh, movement is a, um, it's a movement um, that includes the, uh, the Catholic Church, but it's, it seems like it's being spearheaded um, a lot by um, apostate Protestants too. And they are trying to put issues aside. It's part of uh, the counter-reformation where they're trying to heal the wounds. They use this language like the deadly wound is healed. They're trying to heal the wounds within uh, the broader Christian community and come together um, on... Um, they're trying to come together in love and in peace, and they're trying to put away doctrinal issues. But the one issue that they are holding to and dear is uh, Trinitarianism. So they're basically getting rid of every other pillar in, in Christianity and just holding, and they're just becoming purely a, a Trinitarian type religion. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll show that more. So, but basically, it's, um, it's a unity that consists of giving up uh, your identity and coming together in harmony, but it's not in truth. It's, it's, it's an error. I'm, I'm, I, uh, I don't know uh, for sure, but I, I, sus I suspect that communion would be the word that they would use. Um, I don't know if they'd use, because Protestants are still a little bit, um, um, they probably would get a little bit irritated, at, um, I think, but um, it's, it's mostly, uh, it's, it's very much worldly and it's very much political is how I would describe it. It's, it's, it's the church's... Um, giving up on honesty and truth and, and heeding uh, policy. And they're trying to unite on policy alone, basically. And so they're just trying to hold on to enough Christian verbiage to get people to go along with their movement. Um, and uh, and they want to they put away doctrine as, so that there's not confrontation or controversy. Yes. What's ver yes. What's very interesting too, and I'm, we're going to touch a little bit more and a couple slides down. What's interesting too is that Sister White has a statement where she says um, J uh, John chapter 17 should be our, our, our creed, and she says things like the Bible and the Bible alone should be our creed. And also the... Um, the, the patented sort of uh, verse of the ecumenical movement is uh, they're also using that, that verse too, um, John 17, and they're talking about Christ's prayer a lot and how we need to join unity. You know, like Bar Barack Obama's campaign, like change and things like that, or hope, um, it was sort of just, it's, there's just a lot of catchphrases, but there's not really a lot of substance underneath it. Um, it's, just, it's a very, very shallow uniting. It's not in principle. So, but we, we will uh, have to look up an official uh, definition um, so that I can be more specific in the future. But good, very good question. And this is Kellogg here. Um, even though he wasn't part of a worldwide ecumenical movement, he had the same spirit. He was trying to do the same things, him and his colleagues. Um, they were trying to uh, change the name of uh, the American Sentinel and, and not highlight the Sabbath so much as to not create so much uh, diversity of, of opinion, and they thought that they could uh, win more converts that way. Um, and he also um, started to adopt a Trinitarian view, and I think it's probably because of popularity, and they, people, people want flattery and things like that, and accolades. And so that's what he was probably searching after. Um, here's an interesting picture right here. I don't know if it might, the print might be a little bit small, um, but I just I'll just read it um, off the screen. Um, basically, what's being cut off right here is uh, this is referring to the Godhead. This is the King James Bible here, and this is Ellen White on this in 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 this column. So you have King James, you have Ellen White, and then these are Trinitarian phrases. And so some of the Godhead phrases are God the Father, Son of God, Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. 
spirit of Christ or spirit of Jesus, um, referred to as God in Christ, that's talking about the spirit, referred to as God and the Holy Spirit, called the Holy, um, called the Holy Spirit a being, uh, zero times in the Bible, zero times in spirit of prophecy, called the Holy Spirit God, zero times, zero times. So it goes through, it's a really interesting chart, um, but God the Father is used 172 times in Sister White's writing. Son of God is used over 5,000 times. The Holy Spirit, tw uh, almost 12,000 times. Uh, the Spirit of Christ, of, above 1,400 times. Now, when you go to Trinitarian phrases like God the Holy Spirit, the Bible and Sister White never use it. God the Spirit, never use it, never use it. God the Son, they never use God the Son. God in three persons, they never use that phrase. Trinity, never use it. Triune God, co-equal, co-eternal, never use that co uh, co uh, consubstantial. First person of the Godhead, second person. And then there's third person, the King James never uses it, and she uses it four times. So you can see of all the Trinitarian phrases, that um, they just never come about because they're misleading. But she does use these biblical, these biblical terms. And uh, it's a really great chart, actually. This is from a website um, called Wittenberg um, 2017. And this is an ecumenical website. And they were... Um, I, I encourage anybody to go and look at it um, um, in your own time because they have got some different things on there. I just went to the Trinitarian portion of the page. But it's a... Um, they're coming together and they're proclaiming the Reformation dead and that um, everything is sort of uh, honky-dory and, and uh, everything is fine and uh, isn't this a great thing that we're all coming together and that nobody's protesting anymore is basically the spirit of the website. And, um, and now let me read. The nature of the Trinity is a mystery. That's the part I want to highlight. The, mis the nature of the Trinity is a mystery beyond comprehension. We can't understand it. But we are invited to contemplate this mystery and relate to each person of the Godhead. So that's kind of a weird first start. They're asking us to entertain and contemplate something that can't be comprehended. In order to meditate on the triune God, we must think in terms of the characteristic of personhood. Persons possess the capacity to live in relational oneness with other persons. God is three persons an eternal, holy, loving, indivisible relationship. So that's how they're defining God as three persons, not a singular being. And, um, and, and they're asking us, this, these churches are asking us to meditate on the triune God. And their statements, by the way, are very, very much similar to uh, uh, Diops uh, at the beginning where he's like, we don't want to unite because of... Um, because we have unique um, doctrinal points, but we can come together in unity, which is in God the Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Likewise, this website says something about how we don't want to create a difference of opinion over pillars and things like that, but then this is not a doctrinal type, um, this is not a doctrinal movement, but then they, but, but doctrine is very, the Trinity doctrine is always very, very important to them. And notice he says, the nature of Trinity is a mystery. That's the most important part. The woman at the well, ye worship, ye know not what. Why? It's a mystery to her. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. He doesn't say them. He says him. And that's talking, that's talking about the only true God. And the Father, he, he needs nobody else. He worships nobody. But Jesus, who is God because he's the Son of God, uh, he's God by nature and by inheritance. He is, he is a God, capital G, where God's little lowercase g by adoption. He worships the Father too, and we will also be able to worship him. Back to this other website. Divisions among Christians are... Uh, antithetical to Trinitarian love. That's a scary statement. So if you're not uniting with these churches, or if you don't believe in the Trinity, um, this is anti 
antithetical to love itself. And, they call it, and they're using phrases now like Trinitarian love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit form one communion into which God has incorporated redeemed followers of Jesus. Now, there's a, even in the Trinity, there's, there's a lot of truth, but it's wrested from its proper context. They use, they, they say things, it's not just pure error. There really is a Father, there really is a Son, there really is a Holy Spirit. The Father and Son, they really do love each other. All three of these powers really are working out for man's salvation, and you can't have love if you don't have the Holy Spirit. But it's, the error is subtle, but it's, it's, it's very poisonous at the same time. So that's basically what I wanted to share. Divisions among Christians are antithetical to Trinitarian love. And that's just a very bizarre phrase, Trinitarian love. Uh, here's a definition, too. They are about doctrine. I just wanted to emphasize this. The scriptures reveal that God is one and simultaneously three. And I'm, I'm not even going to bother reading more of it, but it's just, um, it just goes into agape love, and the Trinity relates to others in harmony, submission, honor. This is really a false love. It's not rooted in truth at all. Does anybody know who this man is? Rick Warren. Um, he, he, uh, he's very much um, a spearhead, too, of the ecumenical movement, widely popular, and he... Uh, is also, has been, but probably more than ever, really taking hold of this, uh, this Trinitarian doctrine and using it to his advantage to gain converts. They're interested in numbers. They're not interested in truth. Um, even if we're few in number, if we have clean hearts, God can have, one will chase away a thousand. Um, so we don't need to worry about, um, gain, we don't want to, change our, our, uh, our message to convert the maximum amount of people or appeal to the common denominator. That is not um, what we are about. Um, two other notable figures in this, uh, that are really capitalizing on um, the widely popular Trinity doctrine is Tony Palmer, um, his logo and everything. And um, he's been hired out by the Pope to bring back in the Protestant churches and bring unity. He's dead now, isn't he? No. Didn't he mm. sell himself on a motorcycle? Yeah, he had a motorcycle mm. accident. He was killed. I think mm -hmm. he's dead. He, he was a very... Yeah. But he was a very yeah. mm -hmm. charismatic person. I'm glad you told me that. Um, we should look at some of his old videos and what he was saying right before he died, because he died re recently, right? Last year. Uh, yeah, last year. Last year. I think I have some videos probably, um, or a video that I could show right before his death, some of the things he was saying. Because I think we can, we can um, the statements from 2015, 16, 17 are still very relevant he, for he today. He was very persuasive, and his whole idea was that we need to lay down our arms against the Catholic Church, and that we need to come into oneness of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, he's, I don't know, he's seemed to be kind of a compelling person, but he's very dangerous. He is very dangerous. The man to the Pope's right there is a bad news guy. He's evangelical. And um, he is also um, really capitalizing on the Trinity doctrine as well. I'd show a video, but I didn't know. Um, I know the Wi-Fi uh, signal is a little bit weak, but um, I'm going to provide a link um, afterwards. I think you'd, you'd enjoy watching this video um, where, where it has the likes of these men and what they're saying. Um, let's look at some like more official statements um, from the Roman Catholic Church. The Holy Trinity is a unique and defining trait of Christian faith. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church states that the Trinity is the Church's most fundamental and essential teaching and the central mystery of our faith which only God can fully reveal to us. All so, the doctrines of Catholicism stand on the Trinity. And that's my next slide, actually. The, yeah, the mystery of the Trinity. And here's the word that it's the mystery again. The mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the Church. And mystery Babylon the Great. How appropriate, wow. too. Um, there's another statement, but 
I, I knew I needed to get here at a reasonable time. I couldn't find it online, but I'm going to uh, roughly quote it where it says, Sunday is the dedication of the Holy Trinity, quote unquote. So there's actually two different gods being worshipped on each day. The w one true God on the Sabbath and the Trinity on Sunday. So that's the mystery of iniquity then, right? There was, uh, yes, I do have a statement not with me of uh, one of uh, Paul's disciples who's, and they're, because he's, there's the falling away happened in the, uh, in the apostolic era. It was, it kind of, it's, it kind of, uh, it was like a swelling, right? It, it, it got worse and worse as the centuries moved on it all the way until the Pope was exalted on his throne. But it was already happening in Paul's day, and he is, he's ref, um, there's, there's a powerful statement where he's talking about one of, one of these heresies, one of these kindred heresies even back in the early centuries was, this, was, was the Trinity. And we know by Constantine and the Council of Nicaea that... Um, this is what, in the first um, ecumenical movement, um, the uh, Trinity was formulated and a huge war broke out where Trinitarians were killing other Trinitarians. And then anybody that believed in the one true God was, was called, a, uh, pronounced an Aryan and then was, was murdered as well. So um, unbelievers were killing unbelievers and unbelievers were also killing true believers in the Godhead. That's actually my last slide and the end of the presentation. So I see the Pope's the minor on, on the right hand side in the background. Yes. That also has some ties into the Trinity, but I'm not um, well versed enough to be able to explain how that actually fits in. But I've seen um, a presentation or a slide on that and it looked really interesting, but I didn't really dissect it enough to be able to teach it. But I believe it's probably the case. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for um, teaching us um, about the dangers of uh, Roman Catholic doctrine and the wine of Babylon. We don't want to uh, sip from that cup and then um, thirst after righteousness too. They're, they're two different drinks and um, we want only that which is from the word of God. We want to be pure. Uh, we realize that um, that there's many dear souls out there that um, are are joining um, and uniting based on this principle, or they don't want to hear these things because it is a um, it is a sensitive topic. So help us to um, be able to share it in a way that's more tactful, more wise, more loving. Because we, we want people to join the small remnant that you have, um, the little company. And I know that if we are true in faith and in, in doctrine and we are striving to obey, to keep your law and to be doers of the word, that you will pour out your spirit upon us and that uh, we will be able to go up even against the entire world and uh, against persecution too. Uh, right now we don't have strength to do your will so we just plead for the latter rain that we would uh, give up all of our cherished sins um, so that we can be a fit uh, vessel and temple for the holy ghost to dwell in us and change us and this is um, my most uh, sincere request and it would be the greatest blessing and the ultimate gift for everybody to have you dwelling in them fully in jesus name amen